Ahojte druháci, vítam vás na ďalšej dopredu nahratej hodine. A my sme minulú hodinu začali klasické Grécko, dnes pôjdeme na tretie obdobie, antické Grécko na helenistické Grécko. A tieto hodiny, keďže idú zo záznamu, tak tak ako na tých prvých hodinách, ktoré sme mali tento týždeň, platí to isté, že vám som zadal jednu jedinú otázku na našej, teda v našej skupine a rovnako link na toto video, že vám stačí odpovedať jednu otázku, aby som videl vašu absenciu. V prípade, že túto hodinu máte zastupovanú, máte suplovanú a vám niekto z kolegov pustil, tak v podstate on alebo ona vám dali pokyny, že ako ďalej pokračovať. Dobre, myslím, že všetko je jasné. Ak by ste mali nejaké otázky, či k zadaniu alebo k čemukoľvek môžete, môžete mi samozrejme písať a ja vám teraz počas hodiny budem samozrejme odpovedať pokiaľ to nie je druhá C v stredu, tretí blok keď mám s maturantami ale zo záznamu môžete pozerať tú prvú hodinu alebo túto už neviem Dobre, môže byť, že už je štvrtok takže záleží ako nám to išlo tak sa ospravedlňujem, ak je to confusing ale nevadí Dobre my pôjdeme teda ďalej, máme teda tú hodinku, ja som si zabudol spustiť, spustiť aj časovač, aby som videl, ale budem to vidieť samozrejme podľa náhľadu na, na bandike. Takže máme kopu času a možno vám sľubím, že určite nepôjdem ďalej po grajkoch, keď to aj preberieme, pretože som sa rozhodol Rímanov vám dať novú prezentáciu, aby ste v podstate tie staré poznámky mohli využiť, alebo ten starý worksheet v zadaní ako poznámky, že vám bude stačiť pozerať moju hodinu a veľa vecí na to prídeme sami. Bude tam len pár vecí, ktoré budete mať vy sami doplniť, ale oproti tým úlohám správeku to nebude také, že, že musíte až príliš veľa sami hľadať. Samozrejme, budú nejaké veci, ale... Až také hrozné to nebude. No ale preto z toho dôvodu vám teda chystám, pracujem na prezentácii, možno takéto nejaké, aby ste mali, mali v podstate takúto klasickú hodinu možno. Dobre? OK, so let's go back. Because some of these lessons were actually art and culture lessons for Dr. Kratochvilova. So uh, you have, she's got PhD if you have the noun from art, so art and culture. So that's really cool in my opinion. So let's move on, let's continue. What we talked about, what we talked about before was this period of golden age of Athens after Greeks defeated Persian invasions at the beginning of the 5th century BC. Uh, and this period of uh, golden age of Pericles was great uh, period of all of it. I told you about great architectural project uh, of uh, building sites of Acropolis and the temple of Parthenon. Socrates was living in the times of Pericles, but Plato later on and Aristotle 100 years after Pericles, that would be times of Alexander the Great, whom he teach, uh, taught, sorry for that. Historians were actually from archaic period till Peloponnesian Wars, which is Xenophon, and he was writing about this period. Isaac Sophocles Euripides were also period for very general period period. Phidias, on the other hand, was the living in the times of Pericles, Miron living uh, even beyond. And all of these guys, Archimedes, would be at the end of presentation on the times when Romans were evading Greek lands of Hellenis Hellenism and the same things with the other guys with very long period around. So it is generally not only Pericles period and this 5th century BC, but even further on. Also, I told you something that would be actually very helpful for graduates, uh, pre maturantov, čiže ak to náhodou maturanti pozerajú túto prezentáciu, tak toto je presne pre vás, lebo jedna maturitná otázka presne o tomto bola vždy problému a keď som povedal na hodine, ste to nezapísali, zabudli, že toto je pre nich. So sorry for second, grade, second graders, you are now just like as cool, as wise as graduates from history. This is another, another story, you don't see it, so try to make it, okay, you don't see it, but um, my tab uh, keylock doesn't work for you that uh, I can actually, I can't see myself, but you still see myself, so you see me. But these are two famous statues. One is actually lost. We don't know how it looked like. According to descriptions of uh, uh, some historian geographies, Phidias uh, also built in Olympia a great huge statue made of ivory of Godzius. 
uh, also with Nike in here and also his ego and the stuff that he uh, was sending lightnings and thunder down and the rest was covered with gold so uh, of course it's not gold it looks like plastic more more like plastic but the point is that at the time it was supposed to be one of the seven wonders of uh, ancient world you know with pyramids with you will see uh, the lighthouse on the island of Pharos in Alexandria but also gardens terraced gardens in Babylon of the Queen Semiramis so there are many things uh, together but probably this is symbolic thing so you probably all know you've seen this statue actually on, only Roman uh, copy of it which is Discobolos or the disc thrower by Miron by this uh, sculpture Miron uh, this uh, sculpture Miron was a sculptor who made statues of Olympic winners and that's why he made this uh, statues of uh, people in move and uh, even making, not making, actually drawing this uh, position of that you are in this moment of going and throw the disc, disc is uh, such an excellent moment of the moment that you have to stand and well, your muscles are ready, your moves of bones and everything. So it's actually symbolism of these, uh, all, all these things that I told you about antique, sorry sculpture and actually all the art that was realistic, natural, anatomical, moving very humane at the same time moving actually humans on the level of God you know in many religions uh, it's not uh, it's not allowed to sorry it's not allowed to uh, uh, show to depict Zobrazovat to depict the face or uh, the body of God at the same time so for this uh, understanding God's divinity as a human stuff was really cool and that's why it was repeated Another thing that you have in here are three orders that you must know because it's part of your gym, gymnasium, gymnasium. But actually, by the way, I told you what was, was the name of the school in Athens. That was Academia. But uh, later on, uh, uh, later on, uh, Aristotle uh, started a school that was very famous. That's why Philip II uh, hired him as a teacher, personal teacher for his son. And that school, his school was called Gymnasion, in which they had to train to practice in PE, physical education, but also in philosophy and literature. That's why you you may not you may like it or not, but our school Gymnasion prepare actually from various types of sciences, from natural, from languages, from humanities, even physical education is a very important part of it. So if you think that you may not like, let's say, history or chemistry, just keep in mind, you pick up school that uh, is developing in these ideas of Kalokagatia, that you should know everything. That's why Square Heads Kotskachi is acting very cute, very nice nickname for, even for me, for us. Don't take it as a bad thing, but as a good thing and showing that you are actually universal uh, scholars. And this is part of it for architecture because this will be repeated for me. in all these periods I told you in Renaiss in Roman times in Renaissance in uh, in the Baroque period in classicism when you walk Washington D.C. Uh, in USA you will see buildings uh, in this Greek style uh, marble buildings with tympanon that is triangle shaped roof and with pillars and every pillar would be the same. But the only difference would be the heads of the pillars I'm showing right now. Here you have it developed. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot draw it to you. Maybe I should have added also the like ground plan, of it. Because imagine that in the top of it, there is like decorated stuff. At the beginning, in archaic period, that was very simple um, called thing that was called abacus, abacus. But it was very simple round circle. Okay, so it was very easy because very easy, very simple. They start to call it Doric, Doric style or Doric order. Či Dorsky slog podekmenia Dorov, ktorí boli tí poslední, ktorí prišli, keď sa nepísalo. Very simple, just like Dorians, barbaric. Let's use it. And this is archaic period. If you see temple with this stuff, it and it is old. It is not in Washington D.C. or in like Vienna or Paris, France. So it is Doric. It is archaic period. Then, during classical Greece that we talk right now, they start to use, this is probably the most famous thing, that is this volute, 
voluta. It's written in here. This snail-like type should remind probably how the plants are growing because if you see that plants like let's say peas, hrašok, it also goes like this, okay? And this universal stuff is also like golden ratio. I think that it was similar count for counting actually uh, uh, number P and uh, like 3.14. And this was symbolic artistic depiction of mathematical scientific approach. And this way, Yonic style from uh, ground plant Spodorisu was like, like, like this type. Okay, so there were four corners with volutes. And well, I should I should actually find it, look for that. So this is uh, okay. So Greek orders, and let's say ground plan, ground plan, but pillars, Greek orders, pillars. Albo columns záleží či podporu kolmi slub stojící len tak a pillar je taky čo podporuje, čiže něco nesie. Dobře, máme tu něco. Tak je to ground plan, nevidím to nikde, pritom je to toto by mohlo byť niečo. Dorsky, hľadám, hľadám, nenachádzam, možno som zle nahodil. By niečo mohlo byť. No dobre, nevidím to veľmi pekne, ale skúsim som možno nejaký bočný pohľad. Dobre, tento, aby ste mali predstavu. Čiže to, čo som vám vravel, tak si predstavte, že v podstate sú to štyri takéto volúty, tie slimáky. Niekedy sú takto vedľa seba, niekedy sú presne, že dopadajú kolmo v podstate na tú os, na tie na ten prierez toho stĺpu. And this is really cool, this is really famous and it became so popular that you can see Many buildings, capital, USA, Washington, D.C., you see those pillars in here. But you see, there is this is another different, because there are volutes, but they are even decorated more, because they are handing, they are keeping also a lot of various small things that look like leaves of uh, some plants and uh, flowers of some plants and so on. That's why also you can see volute again. But Roset, it means rose. Acanthus, you know, Acanthus, it's, uh, it's this oriental uh, plant and leaf. So you have actually decorated, so uh, a lot of decoration in here. And this is called Corinthian or the Korinsky Sloch. Sorry, I didn't tell you about this uh, classical period. It's called Ionic Order. Doric sample and first one. That's why archive, just after the Dorian page. Ionian, because Greeks didn't want to be shown as Dorian people, simple barbaric. So they already claimed that they were Achaeans and Ionians, these old tribes, you know. So that's why they call this classical style with volutes, they call it they call it Ionic or the Ionsky Sloch. A keď Ioni boli tisíc rokov pred nimi. And the last one is Corinthian order, Korinsky Sloch. Uh, according to city of Corinth, but it is from the third period I'm going to tell you about this lesson and it's called a Hellenistic period. Čiže Hellenistické obdobie je typické týmto korinským slohom, korinským štýlom and that's why it was widely used by this Alexander of Macedonia empire then it uh, moved thanks to this, this style moved to Asia Minor, to Persia, even to Afghanistan, to Egypt and to Roman Empire. And Romans, they loved it so much, they made copies of all three styles. Later on, in Renaissance, they start to use this especially Ionic and Corinthian order. Uh, in the classicism, you saw this capital and White House and uh, Lincoln's monument, all of them use in Vienna, in Paris, you got a lot of buildings. Even in the Botanical Garden, you will see Ionic order pillars on the facade of uh, the buildings of Mining Academy. So you see that it's uh, not only the point like why this why not like Gothic architecture use it. I tell you why because Gothic, Romanesque, even Baroque mostly were concerned on God, on belief, on on heaven, on maybe some other stuff. But classicism was period of French Revolution, American Revolution that gave rise to individual just like Greeks democracy. Uh, Renaissance, again, Italian free cities in Middle Ages, the people were free, they were independent, you know, and nobody forced them like in our kingdom or in Fra French kingdom to be there. So Renaissance and just like classicism was actually repetition of this style, but this style was only the 
the fashion that uh, express some ideas, some opinions. If you wear t-shirt Nirvana, probably you value some values about freedom, equality, maybe somebody about drugs, uh, about protection of nature, and so on. If you wear t-shirt, green t-shirt with double cross, probably you value some about that your nation is cool and great and white race is fine, you know. So this is if you wear some, I don't know, hip-hop style or I don't know, like a... Come on, like size, probably express opinions that you have inside. Your philosophy is expressed in your art, in poems, in books, in music, in architecture that you use. Okay, so that's why uh, it's actually I was happy that I persuaded um, Dr. Kratochvila. She gave me these lessons because it's really about art and culture, very a, a lot, and it gives a lot. Final thing that is important for us uh, from classical Greece, definitely theater, tragedy, and comedy around. Mm, probably you had lessons at uh, Slug Language with Mr. Zilig and Ms., uh, Mrs. Cervenakova and Mrs. Labudova. She safe, I believe so. Um, this was one of the greatest things that Greeks gave it. We already talked about the Iliad and the Odyssey, but in this period, uh, Greek city-states uh, studied this phenomena of uh, cultural events called uh, drama or called theater. Drama is actually, it sounds like something dramatic that was mostly concerned the theater performance that is serious, that is most of a tragic end. It's not funny at all. Uh, these tragedies were like basic, uh, basic stories that they used and they provided uh, for, um, for people in order to give them a uh, catharsis uh, that I believe you probably you won't see. Okay, I have to look with my name. Okay, so catharsis, I will read it for you. But you know this Oedipi King Oedipus, for example, Antigone, Prometheus Bound, in the Renaissance, Prometheus Unbound, written by uh, John Milton, I believe. Euripides, Iphigenia, and how it is. Trojan women by Euripides. So there was, uh, there were many, many uh, of these tragedies, and the point was that there was really dramatic story. You actually cannot imagine uh, theaters like today. They, of course, they build these beautiful amphitheaters uh, that, when you speak here, even people sitting in here can hear you, and for five thousand people, for example. And uh, at the actors, they had usually these big uh, halls in here, preparing, taking their costumes. They were wearing masks, uh, laughing masks in case of comedies, smile tragic in case of tragedies. And they were singing uh, their parts. So it was most like, oh, we all are. And behind, there were more people who were reacting. For the audience to know, for the crowds to know whether it is good or bad. Oh, what a, like five people screaming like, oh, that's a treachery, that's a treachery. Oh, poor Oedipus, poor Oedipus. No women were allowed to uh, play, uh, to act. So even uh, female characters should be uh, acted by male uh, actors who had like, like thinner voice, for example. And uh, uh, what else? So people could attend it for free in Athens, for example. Again, women were not allowed to. Later on, even women sometimes were allowed to attend and so on. But of course, there was no television, nothing similar. So for Greeks, attending Olympic Games, one for four years, sport events and these theaters, it's like the only culture they had. So even the stories had to be excellent, that survived centuries with a dramatic, uh, emotive, and philosophical meaning. Usually, the heroes died, they suffered a lot. So in the end, this negative end, if I ask you, do you like movies with good ending, with happy end, or with like tragic end? Yeah, probably everybody likes happy end, but which do you remember? Those with tragic or those with happy end? Which of these movies gave you more to your soul, to your uh, opinions, to your philosophy? To your beliefs, probably tragedies. So if you watch also the list of the best movies, they are all like uh, dramatic, you know, Shawshank Redemption and so on. Yeah, there is small happy end, but for the others it was very bad. So in, during watching this, you feel kind of empathy. It means uh, sympathy with the hero, but this hero is dying in the end. And you know why he's dying, because it was his fate. The gods did so, he had made some mistakes, uh, people betrayed them, and so on. And next time, when you live 
your life and you when you met with similar situation in lifetime you may remember this tragic hero and if you and the, the feeling you had that you felt sorry for him the pity sometimes you said that you should be better you should do better you should live your life and take the best the most of your days the days of your life this moment of feeling the tragic story is called catharsis and it means purifying purity ochista purifying your soul with the empathy of tragic dying the fate like hero okay so this is the thing that makes tragedies very important for to life i don't mean that you have to watch horror movies or something that there is like killing everybody but there should be some evolution of characters uh, the story should have something that is there and in this way you can div divide not only comedies and tragedies but even good movies and bad movies of course even comedies can be excellent and there were many funny stories in here but when we talk william shakespeare that of course is another great uh, playwright from renaissance and almost baroque period you see that the, he had many comedies but also they got some moral message you know hidden inside and uh if you live it yeah you were happy but at the same time yeah that was that was good i should be better i should be a better man better human and sometimes you know this was actually kind of a moral code that they didn't have in religion because their gods were just like humans cheating lying treacherous and and stubborn and so on just like humans so the moral code of greeks were actually from these things from education and from catharsis okay but still not the end because we are moving to uh peloponnesian wars uh, wars so that would be different if you are interested more in uh, these uh drama and so on so just like i the previous lesson i showed you some videos by john green and that we will be watching uh, at back at school and maybe with some assignments uh, but the point is that the similar crash course is also not by john green but the other guy and about theater and first episodes first episodes are about greek theater so thespis and athens lesson from aristotle about greek comedy about satyrs aristophanes about music flute i really had to watch it obscene first hmm, i shouldn't do that roman theater so that would be seneca plautus you see we'll come to that later on but if interested there's not history only in this crash course uh crash course um in greek drama series but as you'll see was a good idea okay sorry for that i have to close this guy okay but you'll have you'll see even uh other other subjects like linguistics big history i don't know that's a brand new channel yeah have to watch it chemistry literature geography that's really cool but you know a lot of stuff from mr winter mr schmidt's lessons so that uh perfect so actually co cool things in here can help you with economics even sociology psychology government it's really really cool to watch it i think ecology biology here yeah, engineering which is physics too so uh many things in here that can be helpful even for you guys okay let's go back because I, I realized that we don't have only culture but we have this topic to go which is peloponnesian war and we'll talk more about sparta uh that used to be a really model for many societies and commanders but as i read like uh recent uh studies maybe it was just propaganda of spartans they were not such great warriors and so on only they let others know that they are great warriors only to scare them but once it came to wars they actually won this one but uh, they couldn't defeat romans or macedonians okay so sparta is situated in a very southern part down in the south of peloponnesian peninsula actually whole greece is peninsula but this is called attica and only this corinth here in the corinth there is a strait a canal channel built but this is called peloponnese peloponnese peloponnesian peninsula and down the south a small town of sparta even today it's very it's not a village but a very small town and uh, during Dorian uh, expansion, during Dorian invasions, uh, some of these Dorians came down to the south and uh, coming in here, this tribe overruled and slave original population. They let them live, but they served them as slaves, servants. <clears throat> and to keep their power, these Dorians, now Spartans, 
had to brand build a big military society so they could keep <clears throat> sorry their privileged aristocratic position in society like the citizens and most of the people were still enslaved or rich population called hair lords for this thing uh, you can't see the 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 name the word sorry for that is Licurgos Licurgus was like most legendary leader who made kind of a local or combina combined uh, system of in uh, in Sparta. So as I told you, I mentioned already this stuff. So that was Peloponnese Peninsula. Uh, people were Dorians, but original population was enslaved and served for these Spartans. Uh, these guys were called Helots. But as you can see, I didn't write capital letters, so it's not a name for a nation, for a tribe, but it's a name for social class, like students, teachers, okay? Uh, but originally they were, they were uh, like a tribe, but they were enslaved. And of course, very often they tried to rebel against their oppressors. So in this way, Spartans had to build like a very strong military society that also kept their government stable and Lycurgos made it that it was kind of combination of more of them. So we talk about combined constitution, čiže kombinované ústave, kombinované štátno zriadení. Firstly, it was monarchy, but you already know, Matej said uh, that it was diarchy or duarchy, many, a couple of you said it, that they had two kings, they were being elected. So among the guys who were figureheads, so the guys who actually brought their law into practice, usually kings, strong men who commanded the, the soldiers, and they had this respect. Then they had five efforts, elected council that held true power in Sparta, were the heads of the richest families, that's why we can talk about oligarchy in here. And finally, council of elders, Jarada Starshik, 28 citizens over 60. Not only oligarchy, but also they were elected like this. So it was combination oligarchy and democracy. And still all of these kings, efforts and council of elders were all elected by citizens assembly. Citizens assembly were 10,000 Spartan men. Warriors, soldiers, no halots, no foreigners, no women, no kids. Despite women had like big, much bigger rights than in Athens, but not to vote. And in this way, so we can say that it was democracy in one part for some people, oligarchy with its like ephors and council of elders, and still monarchy, kingdom or duarchy for uh, the two kings. So it's also interesting and I think good for you. Uh, as a military society, they had to prepare and train uh, all the um, guys, as you can see, even like uh, little boys had to train in a special how to like boot camps, let's call it training centers, where veterans or uh, old soldiers were uh, bringing them up training to be excellent soldiers and hoplites and so on. The strict education was really like harsh because they were taken by at the age of seven from their mothers and in these like boys camps were trained uh, they were wearing only like some <clears throat> you know, simple clothes around their hips they were not giving a lot of food in, until they got it them by themselves they were supported in stealing go and go to the woods and kill kill some animal eat it you know? so in this way very harsh living also in very simple they had only even they didn't have beds they had, like simple place where to sleep they didn't own anything so they, for all their life, they had to get used to uh, fight. The, they were supporting fights among boys, you know, uh, harassment uh, or, for example, uh, bullying. And they provoked them. Okay, so go and fight him. Fight the bully. Kill him. Even when he was killed, it's okay. You have to be better. You cannot be killed. And you have to help each other. So sometimes they support to fight each other. But when it came to proper, proper training, they supported each other, but only themselves. But I mean Spartans together. Still, they called themselves with different name: Lacedaemons, Lacedaemons, Lacedaemonchanie vlastenazo, ako Spartania sami seba nazivali. And that's why we talk about Laconians, Laconci, Laconchanie. Okay, Spartans, another name for them. But this is how they call themselves. So when they saw themselves, they kept together as one man, but it's very harsh. When they were about like 13 or 14 years old, they were sent to the woods. They, didn't come, they couldn't come back until they hunt a wolf or a lynx or a mountain lion. At the time, they still like something like panther or puma living in Greek mountains or European lion. And they had to kill them 
or they could kill uh they could kill a uh, buffalo with a with a spear only like imagine teenage boys younger than you had to kill this predator or dangerous animal only then they could come back and they were given more clothes and they were given some rights to serve uh, for the military once they were old enough like 17 16 or 17 so they were uh given actually sit they were given citizenship they were given armor and very simple house and also they were given a wife they could find themselves a wife and couple of helots so slaves to find and they could farm on their own land but still they were like only watching on the, around their farm controlling you know helots if they work but still warriors all the time they had to fight uh, against helots oppressing them killing them and so on but still protecting them because their power was based upon them. Well, in case of war, they 10,000 Spartan warriors were actually better than any other soldiers around. Today, we believe that probably it was only uh, propaganda of theirs because later, even thanks to Olympic Games, even Corinthians, Megarans, or Athenians were training and they were also very great thanks to Lokagatia, Gymnasium, and so on. They were excellent soldiers too, but these Spartans were really cool. Imagine that if you had a baby born that was disabled, so uh, they didn't want to have it, they had to be strong, so they gave it to the priest who take the baby climbed the cliff and he threw the baby down from the cliff. For that reason, Adolf Hitler admired Spartans. That look at them, they were excellent society because they were getting rid of disabled. Just like Adolf Hitler, there was program of uh, actually killing, euthanasia, uh, disabled people, Nazi Germany, 1930s. So as you see, sometimes, yeah, fighting Persians, cool, but the others didn't like them very much because they were like slavers, you know, ma slave masters for them. Athenians didn't like them because they believed that the Dorians, they are stupid, they are fools. To prove that they are not, they had to be educated too, but not enough, because if you educated enough, you usually resist, you don't respect authority, you want to argue, discuss with teachers and so on, with elders. And if you're wise enough, you can trick them. So in this way, they were trained also to read, to understand, to be very clever, but to be very brief and uh, answer in the way that you follow the orders and you just understand it. You understand the point. So if somebody asks you something tricky, so you have to be very wise enough to give very clever and short answer. That is called laconic phrase. Uh, what I told you about living in Spartan conditions, tak ono v spartských, spartianských podmienkach sú veľmi tvrdé, náročné, jednoduché, tak keď poviete lakonicky, niekom odpoviete. So it's very sarcastic, simple, but still tricky. So once when Persian armed emissaries of Xerxes uh, came, so they firstly visited before they they had visited city-states, even Sparta, and um, according to, uh, to Kyrides, According to Thucydides uh, and Herodotus, uh, the Spart these emissaries were talking to Spartans and they tried to scare Spartans, but they were like, okay. And uh, they told them, but you know, when our army of our, uh, army of our king, uh, uh, when they come, there are so many, there are thousands of, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. And when they only, and our archers start to shoot uh, arrows from, uh, uh, from our bows, so there will be so many arrows in the sky that they would cover the sun, that there would be night during the daylight. So what shall you do? And Spartan king Leonidas, he just replied, and this laconic phrase, very, very short and brief, so much the better, we'll fight in shade. So it's, it's, it's easy, come and take them. So this is the thing, come and take our weapons. So this was something that we have in education that, uh, as I told you about Kaloka Gatia, but also education is that, for example, if in this nice picture, I was actually looking for a long time for the similar one. In Athens, schools were taught reading, writing, mathematics, music, poetry, sport, gymnastic, gymnasia, gymnasium, gymnasium, grammar school, like we are, you know, until 18. And academies were set up to study philosophy, rhetoric, and ethics. This is like university later on. 
Girls were taught homemaking skills, they could not attend school. So you see on one hand, wise men, but not allowing girls to study. But Sparta, boys, at the age seven, taken from their parents, taught and, uh, the art of war. Okay, we know that. Had to steal to survive, we know that. At the age of 20, males entered the military. So when they had already family and they were fine, they earned enough money to keep their armor, buy their armor more and more, so they had to serve in at, at the wars. Girls, on the other hand, were uh, since the seven, they were uh, reading, writing, gymnastics, athletics, and survival skills. Why? Because when men, 10,000 men, were on the campaign, on military, military campaign, still there were thousands of helots, 50,000 of them, who could kill all the women and their children, so even women should have been skilled enough to take care of them and to be wise enough to take care of society in case men were not at home. So you see, interesting difference. Still at the same time, both cultures, well, the education and wisdom, Spontans had to learn to recite the Iliad by heart. Imagine. And if, I don't know if you know the story, it's like the book is like this thick together, whole poem, and it's probably impossible. Uh, I had some friends from Greece and Cyprus, and they told me that they had to learn by heart, just like we learned Detvan or Moraho, for example, or Otsvarola, my Ivan Krasko, we had to learn it by heart, and they had to learn all Iliad. So imagine even the most stupid Robocop, you know, Terminator from Sparta. So you had to learn this uh, Iliad to memorize and to recite it, to be excellent at this poetry and understand the moral and education. So still they were wise, not without showing it off. Uh, and not like Athenians, they were learned not to dispute, discuss, because it took long, too long. Just give brief, tough, still clever, or sometimes funny response, laconic, sarcastic. Uh, generally, these two uh, armies started to uh, f um, compete, or these two not armies, but cities, they started to fight each other because uh, the, it was different systems, and probably they were like jealous about the, each other and concurrence at trade and just the dominance in Greece. Uh, because Athenians were most like concerned on navy and sea, Spartans had the best infantry, Chiripehota. Uh, also, Athens were more about this democracy and philosophy, Sparta mostly, like let's say generally oligarchy, for example. And both of them, they attracted other states, city-states, with similar constitution and form of government. In this way, uh, Athens uh, created the kind of military union according to island of Delos. Again, you don't see it, but it's here in the map. And here in the island of Delos, they sign up a coalition, creation alliance, like NATO, you know. But uh, this was a Warsaw Pact, and Athenians were dominant, but they call it the League of Delos, or Dalian League, Chedelsky Spolok, or Belska Liga. So Spartans, again, attracted, because they, these guys, they had these democratic uh, naval city-states, so Spartans uh, created, co like, uh, their allies, they call it Peloponnese League, or Peloponneski Spolok, or Peloponneska Liga, with all the countries and city-states which combined with monarchies, duarchies, oligarchy, that's why Corinth or Thebes were on their side. But the problem is that they start with these Peloponnesian Wars. Every time when Athens were attacked from the land, they got on their ships and their islands. Where Spartans got or Corinthians got on the ships, they were defeated. So this is something similar that we talk from Napoleon, the Bonaparte period. We talk that France, in this case, uh, Sparta, was like the, an elephant. And Athenians, and at the Napoleon period, it was United Kingdom of Great Britain. So Britain and uh, Athens were a uh, whale. So two biggest animals on the earth, but one on land and one in the oceans. So they never, they can never meet and clash the fight who is better. Unfortunately for Athenians, uh, it was not enough because when you don't have land, you cannot produce enough food on these rocky islands. So that was even more important to keep the colonies that they had colonized like three, four centuries ago. If you remember, I told you that there was in Asia Minor and there were many Athenians around, guys, okay? But especially the most important was the Sicily. As I told you, that the production was almost for all Greece. And Athenians were really suffering at the end of the war and when Pericles was gone. 
they were thinking about looking for new sources of uh, food for Athens and uh, for Athens. So they decided to organize big naval campaign in which uh, they would like to claim and occupy territories of Sicily that behold to other like neutral kingdoms. But this Sicilian expedition of Athenians was a disaster. In Syracuse, because it was also a place where, Arche where Archimedes was like not at that time, but Syracusans, the, these Greeks had long tradition of great development of war machines and their fortification was full of various catapults and ballistas and various machines that later on Romans adopted and they could defeat their armies. And in here they uh, they were defeated. The other thing, there were many storms around and also Greeks couldn't find proper coast where to land and get water, for example, because it was very rocky. So many of their ships just shipwrecked. They, they wrecked down on the on the coasts. So when uh, it was defeated, also uh, their navy was so weak, they couldn't bring back enough men. So Spartans now with all these Peloponnesian League and even with their brand new allies, with Persians, even with Persians, with a great army invading Greece again, but to, to support Sparta and Peloponnesian League. So they finally conquered Athens with civilians, men and children. The only thing that they left was that they could keep, Athenians could keep in their harbor only 12 battleships, 12 trirema. That was only for basic uh, protection from pirates. And not from the others, so they completely destroy their uh, like military power. They had Athenians also had to pull down walls. Why? Because when you have walls, you can protect. When you don't have, you are defenseless. But immediately, when Corinthians, their allies, wanted to enslave Athenians, Sparta said no. Why? Because we defeated them. We proved that we are better soldiers. We are better warriors than Athenians. We destroy their military power. They are not threatening to. They are not threatening us anymore. They do not threaten us. So, so only the thing we just dominate. We overrule them, but now we shall protect them. Their women, their kids would be free. You know, even new Athenians, of course, accepting our dominance, will be free people because they are Greeks. They cannot be enslaved like helots. Which made Corinthians very angry and very soon after the end of this war, Corinth started another war against Sparta, which lasted for more, much more longer and during the times of Alexander and even beyond, until Roman uh, Republican army came and occupied all Greece. So as you see, democratic style, but uh, warmongering because of the hilly terrain, Greeks were fighting each other. After this, during this period, Greek city-states got really weak. At the end of Peloponnesian Wars was invasion of northern Greek kingdom of Macedonia under the rule of Philip II. But how can somebody defeat Spartans with their super Terminator excellent super combat soldiers and Athenians? And this is a period we have in here. I'm checking we got like 18 minutes. So I believe I can do it at once and we can finish Greek uh, topic in today. The third part of uh, Antique Greece is Hellenistic period. Uh, Hellenistic means like Greek-like. Doslovky, že po slovensky mám povedať hellenistické, tak zná to, že grecké, ale nie grecké, ale ako grecké, greckoidné, že podobajúce sa na grecko, kopírujúce grecké niečo. Čiže, keď nepoviem americké, ale amerikanistické, amerikanské, či na štýl niekoho. Uh, what does it mean? It's not only Greek, but it is copying the Greek, because now at this moment, thanks to Philip II, and especially his son, Alexander, Greek culture and ideas and philosophy and architecture and drama will spread around that world, especially in Asia, in, East, uh, in Western Asia, and combine it. And this is called Hellenism. So uh, now that's why we talk about Hellenistic period before the 4th century invasion of Philip II until arrival of Romans, as I told you, Roman Republic. So Macedonia today, northern Macedonia is in here around Skopje, only southern part of this country was Macedonia. But these Slavic people who came here much later, one like, uh, like maybe nine centuries later, they only took over the name of northern province of Greece. Even today, when you come to Thessalonica, to Saloniki, to Soluna, and this northern part, you'll see that it's Macedonia, Macedonia. 
these guys were uh, Dorians who remained here in the north and they didn't bother these Persian wars and uh, Peloponnesian wars so much. Yes, of course, when Persians came, so tried to fight them, but they were defeated. But what happened? So for the other Greeks, for Hellenes, for Achaeans, they were like barbarians in the north. But what happened when King Philip II uh, came to the throne? You see that he didn't have eye because there were many attempts to assassinate him. Assassinations, them an attentat. He had a dream about unifying uh, all the Greeks, but at the time they were fighting each other in Peloponnesian Wars. Even traitor Spartans invited us for help Persians, you know, to defeat Athenians. Were great philosophers, you know, creators of their culture. So in this way, he, he was thinking how to change this typical warfare of hoplites, hoplito, či težka pechota, heavy infantry, and he came with the idea of phalanx or phalanga, and that allowed him to spread the borders around to Thrace and down to Thessalia, and later on to attack other guys. So what did he do? At the Battle of Chirona, he defeated uh, combined Spartan armies and other Greek armies, with a formation of uh, also hoplites with different shaped uh, helmets. But what was the difference was that they held, they fought with very long spears that were about like even from five to six meters long. Imagine this spear that is as big as your flat, for example, as long, and you have to march in line. So, of course, smaller shields that they had to protect from arrows. So they tried to fight in this big formation and very quickly to obey the guys, the commanders and musicians with the trumpets. They were giving signals how to move, when to raise the spears, turn around, you know, left, right and so on. Thanks to this, they were able to march and after long trainings, these phalanxes were able with all these like... Uh, like these animals, the cobras, you know, uh, they were able to crush the lines of hoplites of Sparta and Athenians. And within a couple of years, they were able to defeat all these Greek city-states and dominate about them. Uh, again, another video of Kreshko's history is about uh, Alexander the Great and situation after and he's in Persian Wars again, uh, and why was he great, and so on, and it would be, it would be really cool. And also, again, what I told you about this Aristotle and his style uh, and his warfare. Okay, my internet is really weak, so I'm really happy that I'm recording this video, this video for you. Uh, okay, so. I got yeah, Alexander in here. I just wanted to show you this uh, these characters. <laughs> okay, this that okay, but we'll come to that point because still we don't have Alexander in here in the scene. So let's meet him. Philip II was assassinated. He was stabbed by his, some generals, and immediately his son, that was like twenty something uh, years old. He had been preparing for this life of a king, and Philip II, despite he didn't like him, he was very bad at him. So he wanted to make him great king. But at the same time, as if you remember, his teacher was Aristotle. So he was excellent commander and very wise and clever man, almost a genius. Very quickly, he got rid of the assassins of his father, and he started to follow his dream by unifying Greeks. So he just finished the occupation of Greeks and unifying them by force. So suddenly, all Greek city-states became part of Macedonian army. And uh, every time he said that, why Greeks are being divided? Why not unified? Because Persian army always invaded them when it was like this, supporting one on the other side to keep them separated and arguing. So that's why he decided to conquer Persian Empire and their self-confidence came from these phalanxes or phalangas formations and they start to clash and actually a huge army of Greeks was a big surprise for Persians who, when they managed to put together like 80,000, 90,000, 150,000 men for the battles in each battle uh, Alexander had a formation and I don't have a battle plan so let's say Gaugamela battle, I believe I can find it very quickly. So, battle plan, and let's say battle of Gaugamela. Uh, so, what was the point? Okay, we got his picture, so let's open one of these. So, the point was, the point was that usually Persian army 
had like formation of these lines and uh, chariots and so on. And uh, of course, Macedonians had these phalanxes, but uh, thanks to uh, uh, all the phalanxes, they had also like very fast, swift, like riders, uh, riders formations. And what they did usually in every battle, one of the, the two, two wings started to fight and they were moving on the battlefield only to make a space and open a hole in, in the formation. What was the point? Then, in one moment of the battle, when they located where the king, Darius III, we had another Darius, this is the third one, Darius III, when he was localized, so very quickly, this other uh, phalanx started to make this hole opening even more, and once they were very close to the king, so they opened it, Alexander riding his horse with his cavalry tried to attack and get him. In this way, so another picture is the same one, was always in each battle just to open a hole in formations of these Persian armies and look for the king. And finally, when king was threatened, like in this very famous Roman mosaic, uh, when you see Alexander without helmet, do you know why without helmet? So the other soldiers, Macedonian Greek soldiers, could recognize him and give them courage when the king is willing to die without helmet to show him so he gave so much courage and strength that they were willing to fight through the lines and he said that these guys Persians are not fighting for the king they're fighting for life so if we kill the king we also fight their oppressor we can deliberate them so once when they saw they realized he was so close he could even throw the spear at Darius the third immediately chariot Darius started to escape run away when all huge Persian army at Battle of Granicos at Isos and at Gaugamela realized that uh, king is escaping from the battlefield why should we die for him why should we die for him so all the army just ran away that's why for Alexander it was enough for him to only have three battles and it was this Granicos river then it was battle of Isos river then one short trip to Egypt where he was welcome celebrated as as deliberated from Persian occupation and the Battle of Gaugamela and from here the king just lost his army escaped to Babylon then to Persepolis and all the time he was running away but while he was alive still Alexander couldn't be the deliberator of all Persia so that's why he started a great journey that was actually hunting for Darius the third and one of the greatest uh, greatest journeys of any army and campaigns in the world history that was uh, actually Alexander's army coming to India, nowadays Pakistan, when they clash with Indian Rajas at the Battle of Hidas Pass. So in this way, finally he managed this to come to India and even to Afghanistan and Tajikistan today, which they call Bactria. But because uh, they uh, finally they kept him, actually he was killed. I mean, Darius III was killed by his own people and his head was brought to Alexander. Look, we killed him for you. You did it, so you shall be killed. Why? Because still he was a king. So what would you do to him? I just would force him to bow down in front of me and respect my power. That would be all. Maybe I, I could send him to exile, but not to kill him. So that was very interesting, but it was one of many, many deeds and activities that... Alexander proved that he's very different conqueror from the others. Uh, when they came to India, it turned out to be more like geographical exp expedition. Like they were crossing Hindu Kush, 6,000 meters high mountain passes of Pamir and Chan Shan, and coming down to this Indus River Valley. And his next plans were conquest of Europe, whole Europe, I mean, like with all Celtic lands and bronze lands and maybe later to Africa, beyond Egypt and so on. So in this way, they had a lot of plans, but his soldiers were so tired for 10 years. Uh, they, they didn't see their family since the beginning of Philip II and suddenly they conquered the world as they knew it, whole Persian Empire. Then he came back to Babylon. It was also a very difficult way along the seas of Iran and uh, uh, Iraq. And here in Babylon, surprisingly, he died. Probably he suffered of malaria. Many people claim that he could have been poisoned. Uh, but the point was that uh, we know today that probably he died of malaria. He was just stuck by mosquito and that was all. Uh, 
You see, 33 years old, just like Jesus, according to legend, but it gave also almost divine uh, position. Tetra Drachma of Macedonia, that is wearing uh, um, ram, uh, ram's horns, because in ancient times, sometimes even gods were depicted with horns. It was a symbol of uh, like divine wisdom for them. Uh, what else? Probably if you want to know more about uh, uh, Alexander, uh, watch this movie from 2004. It's actually very long, uh, with Colin Farrell, and the movie is uh, movie is spoken by Ptolemaios. The Ptolemy was one of his generals in this legend, because since the beginning, when he was taught with Aristotle, he had a couple of friends, and Philip II, his father, allowed him to have these friends, and for all their life, they studied as his friends, and finally the generals. And when he died in Babylon, they divided their empire, and the weakest, but the most clever, the wisest of them was Ptolemy, who became the pharaoh in Egypt, and established big dynasty that we talked about. He built this Alexandria. And uh, he started to tell this story, this Philip II, and these battles of Gargamel, Agranikos, and uh, really great, great stories around. Actually, Greeks were very angry because they depicted that Alexander was probably gay, he was homosexual, which were, there were many of them believers were offended, like insulted. But the point is that he really loved his best friend, like Achilles and Patrocles, you know, from the Troy and we had Angelina Jolie playing his mother. It was really weird, but that was also the thing. The point was that also how he was, Anthony Hopkins, as old Ptolemy telling the stories of Alexander, the great uh, established brand new uh, position how to threat with the enemies that you defeat and what to do further on and this is something that is very important for Hellenism or for keeping this Greek culture uh, to survive uh, actually I keep this uh, picture because I need this battle plan for these pictures uh, so what did he do actually uh, as you see uh, as he was going around he realized it's not good to occupy the lands, but to join them. Let's let's join us and let's create some empire, some land that would be all together. And how to do that? The best way for any monarchy is to have a marriage, you know, to put these families together. You know, it was not uncommon thing even like 100 years ago. Uh, monarchies even today, you know, uh, uh, British princes, English princes cannot choose any woman they like. Prince Charles and Princess Diana. So the thing is that he started to force his generals to marry, uh, to get married with local princesses. This Ptolemy, Ptolemy had to get married with the pharaoh princess. Thus, for Egyptians, he became pharaoh, the god, Ra. And their kids had already divine blood. So not only military, but also this religious and family relationship put together proved that these guys, these mixture of Greeks, Macedonians, and local Egyptians, or Persians, or Bactrians, is actually even valid for them as a new dynasty to rule. And in this way, many of these guys, generals who divided empire after his death, uh, divided his empire. Still, I forgot to tell you a couple of things. Uh, there were prophecies, Greeks believed in prophecies. One of them was about Gordian and not in the city of Gordium. Uh, once there was a, a prophecy that the first guy who enters the town will be the king, and that was a farmer uh, riding a chariot, a car, pulled by oxen, by horses. He became a king, and as for the memory, uh, there was his chariot uh, as a sacred thing, and there was a bound, a knot, that was bounded so hard, and then the prophecy said that a guy who can unknot this bound, unbound this knot, shall become the king and the king of the world. And when Alexander the came, he tried to unknot it, but he just took his sword and he cut it off. And suddenly, yeah, it is another clever idea how to unbound the knot, just cut it off. The other thing that I told you, and very often when he was a young boy, uh, his father bought a horse, Bucephalus, that was very wild, but he tried to let anybody who can tame him, so he can have it. 
And Alexander came and as Aristotle told him, like, you have to be very kind to other people, modest. And he was talking to the horse and so on. And, and horse actually started to respect him and finally he tamed him. And his horse led him in all the battles. He was the fastest horse ever. And so legendary that he ordered to build statues for his horse. And actually he got even his tomb in some town where he died. This is another thing still philosophy was on, and in Athens there was a very famous philosopher called Diogenes, my favorite one. He was from a Stoic movement and skeptic movement of philosophy, and he believed that he, get, he should get rid of all the material possessions to understand the life, enjoy the life, and not, not to have anything material. So he decided to live naked in a barrel, in an old barrel, that was all. And everybody came to him, so he was giving him very funny and tricky replies, and so and because Aristotle taught Alexander and told him about Diogenes as legendary philosopher, so Alexander wanted to visit him. So one day he came, he was so happy, Alexander, to meet this Diogenes, and he said, you know, come to him, and he said, like, you know, I, I really admire you and your philosophy, so is there any one wish, anything I can fulfill for you? What should it be? And he said, get out, get out of my son, you're just making shade on me. And still you cannot cover the sun, guy. So now Alexander, everybody was laughing at Alexander, and he said, you know, if I was not Alexander, I'd like to be Diogenes, to enjoy life in this great wisdom. And Diogenes said, <laughs> according to one version, it is funny one, yeah, so if I wasn't Diogenes, I'd like to be Diogenes. <laughs> so you see that philosophy is really funny. But what's the point, guys? Thanks to these armies, not only building uh, statues for a horse, but even building uh, new towns and cities uh, with with theaters, with hippodromes, with sport events, uh, with temples for all the gods, with respecting all other religions. So they spread to spread this Greek language all around. Uh, also, they start to adopt their culture. Let's say this Ionic order was added with flowers, very popular oriental uh, symbols, and thus Corinthian uh, order came to be. And this mixture start to be a symbiosis of Oriental, thus Eastern, Asian, and antique culture. It called, was caused thanks to these mixed marriages. Of course, his generals didn't like so. I said, you, you have your friend, maybe you're gay, and what to do? So Alexander himself, he picked up a marriage with unimportant, least important princess from Bactria. From the, her name was Roxanne, or Rosen. She was unimportant. Probably they had a baby, but they got lost or killed somewhere. The only to prove that he is not going to claim the rule for his kids in this empire. They will be rulers in their own kingdoms and they should respect local cultures, mix without any problems and new society can come up. And this is called Hellenization, spreading of Greek language, culture, accepting Oriental cults and in the end you have 20 cities called Alexandria, one with the biggest library of ancient world with, with uh, with the uh, lighthouse of Pharos protecting and actually having lights that could be seen hundreds of kilometers. In Afghanistan, a time Buddhist country, you see statues of Buddha, but in Greek toga and in Orad like Apollon, so Greek style Buddha from 2nd century AD. Another Buddha, uh, but again wearing, to uh, wearing toga, you know, so Roman. So that was excellent, amazing sculptures. Even Greeks themselves, they adopted and instead of pillars after Hellenism, this after this Corinthian style, they start to build this uh, typical like uh, shape Persian women Driadas Driadi as a pillars in Parthenon. So they accepted it in the end. When he died, so they, as I said, his generals Lysimachos, Cassander, Antigonus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus divided an empire, and for centuries their kids and grandkids were ruling in these empires until Romans came. Roman Republican army found a way how to defeat their phalanxes with catapults, heavy machines, especially when they conquered Greek towns of Syracuse, where Archimedes, having these catapults and everything, he even constructed mirrors made of copper and bronze that could reflect sunlight and point at Roman ships and set them on fire like ancient lasers. Come on. So this is really huge thing and excellent thing and what is uh, the way how Romans will adopt and accept all these Hellenistic and Greek things. If you'd like to read just uh, Google uh, quotes of Alexander that is really stoic philosophy uh, also coming to the uh, 
excellent things uh, that you can read. And um, together with Aristotle with Socrates, they are really cool. But we are two minutes, three minutes almost over. So last thing, which is the heritage of ancient Greece, is that they transported democracy, they invented democracy, Olympic Games, philosophy, alphabet taken from Phoenicians, drama until today. Olympic Games, you know, architecture, so most, almost all sciences and all like respect to the wisdom. That is philosophy, philo, Sophia, Sophia is wisdom, philo is means to love. Not from only alphabet, but even mathematics, golden ratio that would be uh, used by Leonardo da Vinci and even, even today. Thanks for attention, guys. And that's all for Greece. Next lesson we'll have about Romans. Okay, so... I just turning on. Dobre, čiže ďakujem ešte raz za pozdecka. 4,5 minúty, pardon, ale môžete utekať na hodinu teraz. Takže majte sa. Bye, bye.